wanted to make a statement regarding uh, if you have any questions, please post those to the Q&A uh, down at the bottom of your Zoom uh, rather than in, in the chat. Now I'm pleased to uh, introduce Dr. Paulin Bangudi from Rwanda, who will do the next presentation. Thanks very much for this invitation. I'm very honored to be part of this uh, uh, Saving Life team. So uh, my presentation will be about um, COVID, uh, about uh, pulse oximeter, its role in uh, COVID patients. I'm uh, sharing my, I'm trying to share my slide. And uh, can you all see my slide? Yes. Is it visible? Yes. So, okay. Uh, talking about uh, pulse oximeter for COVID patients. Um, I start by uh, a clinical case where uh, it's a 35 years old female which uh, is brought at a uh, accident and emergency department in coma with uh, a one week history of cough, fever, and the shortening of breath. So her father reveals two weeks ago, she traveled back from China. So those are the typical case, including the case definition of COVID, when you see uh, shortening of breath, cough, fever, and the history of travel abroad, not only abroad, but in a country where we know there was evidence of uh, the spread of the disease. So after investigation, examined and investigation, it is revealed that um, the patient has multiple organ failure. So suppose that the patient on the bed uh, being rolled already intubated in ICU. So here we'll talk about pulse oximeter, PO stands for pulse oximeter for triage and screening. Uh, pulse oximeter for critically ill patient in hospital or in ICU and the uses and the limitation. The last one will be just short because there is someone who will go uh, deeply into that. So I wanted to bring back uh, this uh, slide coming from uh, Professor Donner from last uh, presentation of last, uh, last uh, Tuesday where he was talking to us about hypoxia and all the complication of hypoxia. When someone is uh, having signs of hypoxia and we don't fix the signs of hypoxia and he keep having that hypoxia, he will develop a lot of complications, starting by interstitial lung injury, self-induced lung injury, and parenchymal inju uh, lung injury. All those will be developing as we are leaving that patient under hypoxia. So by the time he reached the hospital, is in coma, like the lady, she's already, it's already late, she's in multiple organ failure. So she's a patient to intubate and to uh, be in ICU. This next slide is showing us a pulse oximeter. And the article, which was published, Effect of Routine Emergency Department Triad Pulse Oximeter Screening on Medical Management, that article shows that with that history, traveling abroad, and one week history of cough, fever, and shorten of breath. This patient was the case definition, and we could have detect hypoxia with a pulse oximeter. Either she went to see a family doc, doctor, or a, in the clinic, or at home, if she could have a pulse oximeter at home and put on her finger, and uh, she could detect hypoxia and start as early as she could treating it with oxygen or attend an hospital before even entering ICU. So this is showing the benefits of a, a pulse oximeter in an early state start of the disease when you are having 
shortening of breath, fever, and the cough. Something is happening in the lungs. There is lack, oxygen is not diffusing properly from the lungs into the vessels, into the blood to be detected. So if you have a pulse oximeter, it can help detecting how much oxygen do you have in your cells, do you have in your finger to know if it is enough for your metabolism. As you are delaying, there is a uh, um, anaerobic reaction starting in your body and some vasoconstriction as a result of uh, compensation, which will end up putting you into multiple organ failure. And so when you reach the hospital, it is too late. So first of all, we can see that in triage and screening, pulse oximeter is needed. Maybe at home or at emergency or in uh, all the houses where we have those patients or elderly uh, patients, we can have pulse oximeter. So we screen regularly people who are coughing if they have hypoxia. The next slide is showing the use of hypoxia and the benefit of it in uh, an actual ICU, being for COVID or not COVID. So we know many patients have shown and pre is presented with uh, RDS, acute uh, respiratory, respiratory uh, RDS, acute respiratory distress syndrome, where they will present with hypoxia. So there is a, a quick test to diagnose acute respiratory distress syndrome, which is called the Kigali modification, which in, in the past, as you can see this slide, people with the Berlin criteria, people used to wait until you have a, a partial pressure of oxygen to found the oxygenation ratio. You need to be on mechanical ventilation with a PEEP, and then you have to use CT scan and uh, X-ray. So this is a typical patient in high developed country. In many low-income countries, those patients, we don't have a uh, blood gas machine to get the PO2. Very few will be on vents, and CT scan doesn't exist, or it will be late by the time you reach there. So this Kigali modification score help patients even at emergency where you don't have a, a blood gas machine, you can have the pulse oximeter. So by the pulse oximeter, the, how you are saturating, comparing to the, your FiO2, which depends on the mask. If you see, we have normal mask, we have non rebreathing mask. Those one, you can know which FiO2 inspired fraction of oxygen you are giving to your patient by detecting which mask are using. So with having which mask your patient is needed to saturate either 97 or what, can give you an image of the oxygenation ratio. You don't need a PEEP. So it means even without PEEP, even before intubation, you can detect another DS patient. And uh, other modification are, you can use just a quick ultrasound. And we know ultrasound is becoming really common in many hospitals before. So you can, with those elements, you can diagnose as early as you can many patients with RDS and know when to transfer them to uh, a high developed hospital or if you can keep them uh, in uh, these hospitals. So this has been, is an ongoing tool. Many people are trying to check if it is valid, but it has been validated. So it's being used in many countries to validate. So SpO2 is at the middle, on the center, and it helps a lot to uh, tackle all the RDS at the beginning. So the uses and the limitation of uh, pulse oximeter, that one will be discussed on by another colleague, the next speaker. So you see that uh, uh, the common area where you uh, are pulse oximeter is used, mostly it is uh, detecting the cardiopulmonary reserve of oxygen. The good thing is not only the saturation, but also the heart rate. And if you know the variation of the heart rate from the bradycardia to the tachycardia, you can really uh, interpret. Your patient can have 100 saturation, but with tachycardia. I mean, something is going on. Maybe pain, maybe it's another cause, 
maybe hypoxia which is being um, is being compensated so it, this will be a, a call sign also if you are very well trained to detect this car to know how to read the car you can learn a lot from this car that's why we advocate for all parsimeter are useful are good but the parsimeter with more advanced with car will help you knowing the notch and read some other data which in other situation will need advanced monitor so parsimeter can give you a lot of data so, but there is some limitation where uh, you may have uh, bad reading because of not zeroing your spo2 or because you are not well perused you are uh, being vasoconstricted or with the nail for the women when they put when they put on the nail some colors it can be difficult to, to read also some other like um, methemoglobin or monoxide of carbon so there is some limitation which you need to fix before knowing if your part of meta is working or not so in summary we know that the part of meta is part of the standard monitor for safety and it has revolution uh, really medicine especially for operative medicine and critical care we we now need to put emphasis on pulse oximeter as a, a triage and screening tool and this, it can help us detecting the sickest the very sick and the mild sick patients at emergency and know how to direct them and also we need to learn how to troubleshoot so we can uh, get a good use of the pulse oximeter thanks very much Thank you very much, Dr. Bagrutin. Our next speakers will be Sharifu, Rajabu, and Ali from Tanzania. And they will be talking about the clinical engineering side of pulse oximetry. Looking for an informative presentation. Thank you. Uh, okay, thank you. It is my pleasure to have this opportunity to share what I have in the fate of this disease, COVID-19 disease. Can you go to the next slide? As Adriana said, the puzzle oximeter, it range on different aspects. If we have the fingertip puzzle oximeter, we have the portable one, and also we have the tabletop puzzle oximeter. All of this, they do differ in its accuracy, and we have to find where can they be used, and how do we know which one is so accurate compared to the other one. So when we come to this fingertip puzzle oximeter, much of them, they tend to be not accuracy, especially if you are trying to measure those value of oxygen saturation that in a hypoxic level. So always each accuracy tend to decrease as you go to hypoxic value. You may find that if you are using a tabletop puzzle oximeter, the saturation of the patient is leading about 60%. And when you do try to measure using the puzzle oximeter that is a fingertip, it is reading almost about 8%. So due to this, it may result into a wrong diagnostic procedure, which may result into also a wrong therapeutic procedure. So how do we know all of this? And where those puzzle oximeters are going to be used? Although even though the fingertip puzzle oximeter, they are inaccurate on the hypoxic level of oxygen saturation, it doesn't mean we have to discard them, especially on this period, where we are in shortage of medical equipment. So what I, I suggest is that those finger to puzzle oximeter should be used by those patients who are in mild condition or also for pre-screening to determine which patient should require to take a COVID-19 test. So it can be used for threshold detection. So this in the symptom of headache increase of temperature is alleged that the lung is getting some infection 
but the pulsoximeter will give much earlier detection. This patient O is undergoing some kind of respiratory problem. So if its oxygen saturation starts to drop, we may just consider this patient should undergo a COVID-19 testing. So those fingertip pulse oximeter can be used either for monitoring those patients that have supposed to be to take self-isolation at home or those that are in ward that they don't need critical care attention. But for those patients that in ICU, we are supposed to use those tabletop pulse oximeter and they can give a good trend of oxygen saturation and they are accurate at both level of oxygen. So yeah. even the patient have lower oxygen, it will also tell us the true oxygen saturation of the patient. And if also it is going a recovery process, it will indicate the indication that is the actual oxygen concentration of the patient. Can you go to the next slide? So here I just try to speak about the specification of pulse oximeter and its calibration. For the specification of pulse oximeter, they are usually specified by the manufacturer where we can find the accuracy of the pulse oximeter and also its repeatability. For the case of calibration, the pulse oximeter, all we clinical engineer and biomedical technician have to look about this calibration of the pulse oximeter but uh, most of them, they once calibrated and they calibrated by the manufacturer. The most principle that is used by the pulse oximeter to take its measurement, they do consider the ratio of oxygenated hemoglobin and the oxygenated hemoglobin. So due to that factor, almost the error that can, that may be to aging of the pulse oximeter will be canceled. So if the pulse oximeter is not accurate or it is deviating so much from the true value, always it means it's the error that may be miscalibrated during the manufacturing process. Although even this pulse oximeter that are cheaper known as fingertip pulse oximeter, they are already cleared by the FDA because they most of the time they do calibrate the pulse oximeter using this pulse oximeter simulator or vital science simulator on the normal level of gen saturation, maybe starting from 90% to 99%. So it is difficult to understand this pulse oximeter, they are not accurate at the oxygen level below 80 or 80% up to 60, which they tend to produce the data that are not accurate. Can you go to the next slide? So here's what I was saying. We have diagnostic with as monitoring, where are the application or specification and diagnostic. So those pulse oximeter that are not accurate. Saying that those the finger to pulse oximeter, they, they tend to be inaccurate on the lower range of hypoxic level. They should be used by those patients that are self isolated that don't need a critical care condition. But what do we need to think about also, this pulse oximeter, although they are calibrated by the manufacturer, we have to, they need to be verified to see if they're still working within the required condition so that we can determine which one is accurate and which one is not accurate. How do we know that? So we have to use those vital signs simulator. So even those vital signs simulator, we need to understand how they operate. For example, on my side, I was using a BC biomedical finger seam simulator. They do have a fingertip similar to a finger of a human being, but inside they are filled with a certain fluid. So that same field, they are designed to mimic a certain oxygen saturation, but they have been calibrated at a certain temperature. So you might find that during its fabrication, it was calibrated at the environmental temperature of about 22 degrees of Celsius. So when you are using a pulse oximeter, you have to consider that also, because even on the aid specification sheets, they do provide you with a graph that indicates the variation of temperature, how the temperature increase with the increase also in oxygen saturation. So on my side, the ambient temperature is about 28. So I just inserted the fingertip that read 92%. But uh, you might find that the pulse oximeter, it is reading 95 or below even 880. 
So with that condition, you might end up saying that, oh, this positive oximeter is not accurate and it is not working. It was supposed to be, Arthur, it's not supposed to, to be you need to finish up in the next 30 seconds. Thank you. Yeah, okay. You're not supposed to be used. So, but if you consider the chart of the temperature and the oxygen saturation, you will find that how you can correlate the variation of temperature with the oxygen saturation. Can you go to the next slide? So these are the limitations of the path oximeter. So you have to understand the error that can result due to path oximeter. And uh, most of them, for example, this one, the problem number one is no signal or SPO2 of the law. It means that maybe the SPO2 is not plugged to its unit, or even the problem is not properly placed to the patient. So most of this, they are error that relate to the user. And the, the most common error on medical equipment that you have to check of them we did try to analyze much of the error that can happen. I think you might find on the other side that explain them that may result the puzzle oximeter to produce wrong results. So that is what I have for today. Thank you. Thank you. And Ali, you can pick up on the next slide. Thank you. Next slide. Hello. Yeah, okay, thank you so much. The demand for technical personnel to maintain hospital about medical equipment is very high. With rapid increases of different type of human diseases, such as COVID-19, cause a electron about medical engineering response to several government initiatives to improve and modernize health service for the country. As you can see, we have so far, we have 18 students graduated this year, 2020. We have over 150 ordinary diploma current, uh, ordinary diploma technicians since 2014. And we have 240 current enrolled in medical diploma and bachelor degree program. We have different uh, students have to visit different hospitals through industrial practical training. We have calibration equipment, as you can see, we have lab training devices, uh, example of 12 lead CG, Vito sign, defibrillators, ultrasound, and so forth. We have uh, trained, we have attended a summer training, uh, which is organized by Duke. Uh, we have also changed the program with the Clemson University, Cornell University, based in USA. We have two master's degree faculty who have attended in China. The same as we have two faculty who have attended the PhD program in Cornell University. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Ali. And Sharifo, thank you very much for that presentation. Very informative for our audience, uh, especially uh, being in the clinical engineering trenches here, um, working uh, against COVID-19. So it's very